Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, so we talk about POP inhibitor because it was, it's really a change in a way in cancer and how we treat our patient now and tomorrow. So is my disclosure. Uh, so the objective was set already. Uh, so as you know, PARP inhibitor is a new treatment that make a big difference in our patient care. And what is the principle of PARP inhibitor treatment? Actually, it's exploiting the vulnerability of ovarian cancer. And when you talk about ovarian cancer, here today we will mainly focus on high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And what is the vulnerability of high-grade serous ovarian cancer? We know that high-grade serous ovarian cancer, when we profile this high-grade serous ovarian cancer, it has this DNA repair damage. So by the high rate of proliferation, half of the patient has what we call the BRCA-like uh, tumor that have a defect in the DNA repair pathway, and how we can explode that for treatment. And we know that the DNA repair, these different pathway, but in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, this pathway is alterated in 50% of the case. So if we know that, then we can use PARP inhibitor treatment to actually have two pathways of DNA repair damage that the cell cannot repair and then will die. So it's what we call the synthetic lethality. And how we use PARP inhibitor in this specific high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Again, big difference between US and Canada. We are a large country in terms of geography. We have less people. And here's the difference between US and uh, Canada. Um, in US, they have different tools, and they have different drugs, too. Um, and they have different drugs that has been approved for treatment in high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Here, I would focus in nolaprib uh, because it's the drug that has been approved in Canada. So what we know about olaparib, so very early, in early phase trial, we know that PAP inhibitor olaparib was active. So different trial was done, and already in phase one, when we do phase one, usually the response rate is around 10%. But here you will see that already we see with the heavily pretreated patient with a BRCA mutation enrichment, the response rate was 28% on the early phase trial. So definitely an early signal of activity of olaparib as treatment that was then proved in phase two and with the enrichment of BRCA1. So you can see here, when you did a phase two trial, the patient with BRCA mutation have an overall response rate of 41% as treatment. But again, the patient who do not have the BRCA mutation still have response. So response rate in this phase two trial was reported to be a 24%. So BRCA definitely is driving the response to Olaparib, but there's a group of patients that benefit beyond BRCA mutation early trial. Based on that, two other trial was designed and many to see how we need to prescribe olaparib. And the new concept was the maintenance treatment. And one of the key trials was a study 19 that you know well, the patient have a platinum sensitive recurrence, were treated with platinum based chemotherapy, responded, and then were randomized between olaparib. The dose is different here because it was capsule at that time, or placebo. And then another trial was done at this relatively the same time. It was a study 41, which say maybe we need to give olaparib with chemotherapy and then continue with maintenance. When we do the combination of olaparib with chemotherapy followed by maintenance, what is important is because of the hematological toxicity of olaparib, the dose of olaparib had to be decreased as well as the carboplatin. So that was the main difference, how we need to prescribe olaparib. First, the result of study 19. So when we analyzed all patients, we have an improvement of PFS with olaparib maintenance from 8.4 months to 4.8 months. And then we got the result of the 41 when we did olaparib with chemo followed by maintenance olaparib. What is interesting here, yes, we always have this PFS improvement, but actually the improvement was seen at the time of starting the maintenance. And why the benefits was only on the maintenance is Maybe because at the time of chemo, we have to dose reduce olaparib and the chemotherapy. So these two key trials show that if we use olaparib, we probably need to use it as a maintenance post-response to chemotherapy. And what was very, very important in this study 19 is that when we look at the overall response for the patient, we have an improvement of PFS, but at that time was not thought to be very significant. But then based on the early trial, based on the rationale of using PARP inhibitor, they look at this subgroup of patient of BRCA. And when they look at the patient with a BRCA mutation, the PFS was significantly increased with Olaparib versus placebo from uh, four months to 11 months. 
Then, based on this very interesting result, uh, Health Canada always need a phase three trial to get the approval of a drug, and this trial was done, which is called SOLO2. So the population of BRCA mutation, giving the result of the study 19, they select the BRCA1 and 2 mutation. Patients were having a recurrence of high-grade serosovian cancer, responding to the platinum-based chemotherapy, and if they have a complete response or partial response, they were randomized between having olaparib maintenance or placebo. Here the dose is 300 milligram BID because it's tablets and not capsule. Why olaparib changed the formulation is because initially capsule, it was eight in the morning, eight at night, which was a lot. So they develop a new uh, formulation of tablets, which is only <coughs> two in the morning and two at night, which is uh, much more um, simple and easier for the patient to take, specifically in the maintenance setting when we want to be uh, as much as we can. And the primary endpoint was a PFS. And here's the result of this trial. Uh, again, very impressive result. We have an increased PFS from five months on the placebo versus 19 months uh, on the olaparib. So very significantly improved. And then again, when we talk about the plateau with immune therapy, I think we also have a kind of a plateau here uh, with olaparib maintenance treatment. So very significant improvement. Based on this SOLO2 trial, uh, then they move to the first line setting to see if we have this response in the, first, in the second line, maybe we can have that in the first line. So they take the population of, again, the BSA1 and 2 mutation, and then they uh, re re randomize the patient between Olaparib versus placebo. And the primary endpoint was a PFS at the time of first line. What is important here is that the patient was at the type, enrolled in the type of maintenance treatment. So most of the patients have a really um, good surgery because bevacizumab was not allowed as part of this trial. So most of the patients in this trial have a complete debulking surgery. And again, here a very impressive result. Uh, the patient uh, who got the Olaparib have a progression most of our patients are still progression-free at 60% of the patient at three years, which is, again, a big difference because in the placebo group, only 30% have a control of disease at that time. So a very big difference in this population. And again, we always, because we are on the first time, it's very important to look at the PFS2, and this benefit is maintained after, at the time of second recurrence. So definitely, this population have a benefit of Olaparib. But what about the side effect? Because we are the first line, we have a maintenance. The maintenance is a specific first line was two years. The side effects were manageable. As you can see here, the main side effect was the uh, nausea. Uh, vomiting was well controlled. We didn't have a grade three vomiting. The main was, was nausea and after some change in the bowel with constipation or diarrhea. We have some grade of neutropenia and anemia as well that was uh, easy to manage. We also want to look at the specific event uh, because we heard about uh, Olapre may be increasing the risk of AML, for example. As part of the trial, uh, 260 patients were receiving Olaparib and uh, three patients uh, got the MDS and AML. So it's why it's important for our patient to keep doing the CBC check to ensure uh, that they didn't have this rare event. They also see some new primary malignancy, but that was seen also in the placebo uh, group, and there's not a significant difference. And then we need to also uh, be careful about any uh, short of breath uh, that appear in our patient, uh, because there's a rare case of pneumonitis as well that was described with uh, Olaparib. So Olaparib has been now uh, approved uh, in Canada and is uh, used at the time of recurrence for the patient responding to platinum-based chemotherapy with a BRCA1 and 2 mutation, and hopefully soon at the first-line treatment. But it's important also to look at the other program and what we know about PARP inhibitor treatment in general. So we have this IL program, uh, which actually used the Recaparib, which is another PARP inhibitor treatment. They have done a phase two treatment um, uh, with a Recaparib, and they show again that the patient with a BRCA mutation have a benefit of Recaparib as treatment. And then they did also the maintenance setting, a big phase three trial, assessing the patient with a platinum sensitive recurrence. And they also have a specific test HRD to see who are the one who benefits the most. So in this specific trial with Recaparib, definitely the patient with BRCA mutation have a benefit of maintenance. And then maybe we can try to distinguish the non-BRCA with the LOH marker to see if which patient will have benefits of maintenance. Another uh, treatment, the Niraparib, have been also 
investigating PARP inhibitor in this setting. They have done a phase two trial that has recently been published showing that niraparib have activity. Um, and this trial actually assessed the niraparib as treatment in this specific group of HRD. So again, a specific test that they use to see if patients can have benefit of PARP beyond the BRCA mutation, and they show some activity. They also did this big uh, trial with a platinum-sensitive recurrence responding to chemotherapy, and the patients were randomized between having niraparib or placebo. Here, in this maintenance trial, they did not select according to the BRCA status. So every patient who was responding to platinum-based chemotherapy were able to go on the trial, and they showed that, yes, the patient with a BRCA mutation had the greater benefits. The uh, PFS was improved from 5 to 21 months, so definitely PARP inhibitor maintenance in the BRCA population have activity and need to be used. But because they do not focus on BRCA, we also know the activity in the non-BRCA. So when they look at the patient who have no germline BRCA but are what we call the HRD, based on this specific test, the PFS was all again increased at nearly 30 months. So definitely there's a benefit beyond BRCA, but we're still trying to see how we can define this population. And the patient who do not have a BRCA and do not have HRD, they are the PFS at nine months. Based on this result, actually, Nirapri was approved in, in US uh, for all commas uh, patients responding to platinum-based chemotherapy. So what we know in terms of PARP inhibitor treatment now in ovarian cancer, we know this activity. We know that the main activity is on the patient with a BRCA mutation, either germline or tumor BRCA mutation. And we know that the maintenance treatment is effective, and we can use that to sequential post-chemotherapy. We know that combining with chemo is difficult, and we know that clinically a good marker is a platinum sensitive. We definitely need to have further investigation regarding what patient benefit for a PARP inhibitor treatment beyond the BRCA. We know there is a patient population that benefit of PARP beyond BRCA. We still need to define that. And if we move the use of PARP inhibitor at the first line, we need to try to overcome the resistance. Before moving to how we will do next, um, I have uh, two questions. The first question, oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> so my, I don't know where is my question. <laughs> OK, great. <laughs> Um, so you have a patient, she's uh, 76 years old, uh, she has a platinum-sensitive recurrence high-grade serous ovarian cancer, we know, because you have done the tumor testing, that she has a, soma she has a, a somatic BRCA1 mutation. She has responding to the platinum-based chemotherapy, so uh, first do you start with Aparib, uh, and if you do, when? And I have some... Um, uh, some uh, um, Potential answer, so first uh, within three months, post-platinum, um, at three weeks, because you keep the schedule of the chemotherapy, or within eight weeks, or within six months. Or never, because actually she's too old, she's 76. So now I can go to after my answer. Okay, perfect. Um, so it's within eight weeks, uh, because all the trial that has been built with the maintenance, Olapri was start within eight weeks. Uh, so we need to try to keep this eight-week mark. And what we know regarding the older population, it was a recent presentation at SGO, that actually uh, all the patients have benefit of PARP inhibitor, regardless of the age, and uh, the efficacy and safety are relatively equivalent between the different group of age. My second question, hopefully, yeah. So now you have a 55-year-old woman uh, that is currently on Olaparib uh, at, at the dose, which is 300 milligram BID. And she complained to you in clinic that she has a grade 1 nausea. And uh, you see on your blood work that the creatine is slightly increased at 105. Uh, so what do you do uh, for her? First, do you stop Olaparib? Or you decrease the dose of Olaparib? Or you continue Olaparib? Okay, so here we have half-half. So I think we can probably continue Olaparib. Uh, we can probably continue Olaparib because she has an uh, increase of the creatine, but actually 
that is usually seen with Olaparib. Like, it will be frequent that actually when the patients are on Olaparib, you will see that you have an increased grade 1 creatinine. Um, that is usually not very toxic. It's usually around 110, 115 of creatinine. So that is usual, and usually we don't have to decrease based on that. We need to ensure that there is no other, um, other cause to explain the increase of the creatinine, but that can be seen with uh, Olaparib. And then for grade one uh, nausea, usually prescribing the anti-nausea medication is sufficient. And usually this, this nausea appear the two first months of introducing the treatment, and then usually settle with time. Sometimes we can also ask the patient to take the tablets with a small snack that help as well uh, to overcome the nausea. So now the uh, next part of the talk uh, will be what now we will do. So I'm so just to summarize of what we have discussed in the first part is definitely uh, it's a success story in ovarian cancer. Uh, we went from the discovery of BRCA1 and 2 mutation to have some really strong preclinical data, then early stage activity in phase 1 and 2, then that was confirmed in the large phase 3 trial, and with after the uh, FDA approval of Oraparib, Recaparib, and Niraparib at the time of recurrence, and then moved uh, to uh, the first line setting with Oraparib showing a benefit in the BRCA1 and 2 population. And we're still waiting the result of the first line treatment with Niraparib, uh, and that will be probably presented soon, where the patient on the first line got the Niraparib as maintenance treatment, regardless of BRCA status, and that may again change how we practice, uh, but that the result is not there yet. So where do we go from here? First, uh, we need to define our target because we know that the patient with a BRCA1 and 2 mutation have the most activity of Olaparib, but it's not, and, like, it's not the only one. We know that the patient with a BRCA-like have also a benefit, and it's why Niraparib has been approved uh, all the commas post-response to chemotherapy. So we need to go back on what is high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And as I said at the beginning, we know that high-grade serous ovarian cancer is defined by this DNA repair defect here, and we need to try to see how we can identify this defect better. So we currently have this companion diagnosis, but it's not enough, and it's not sufficient to really define our population. So we need to develop some new functional tests measuring this uh, homologous repair deficiency. And you had the talk also yesterday about the secreting tumor DNA, and maybe it's something that we need to uh, further assess to see if we can measure this DNA defect in the blood to really predict who will benefit. And it's currently what we're currently doing with this uh, NEO trial, and I know this trial and we know this trial is currently open in different sites in Canada. So it's to take the patient with a platinum-sensitive high-grade serous recurrence. They have deemed to be uh, able to have a secondary debulking surgery, and they will have this Olaparib for uh, six to um, eight weeks of treatment. So they will have a biopsy before, they will go for surgery, and then they will be randomized between the chemotherapy and maintenance Olaparib, or no chemotherapy at all, and Olaparib alone. So as part of this trial, we'll have biopsy and ctDNA is also collected to see if we can actually predict better who will respond to the uh, Olaparib or not, and that is not limited to the BSCA population. And if Olaparib has been approved, then unfortunately we will have to deal with a recurrence post PARP inhibitor treatment. Um, so what we know now from the resistance to Olaparib or different PARP inhibitor treatment. So we probably have three boxes. So first, based on the mechanism of action, the tumor is able actually to restore the DNA repair. So even if at the beginning we have a defect on the DNA repair deficiency, the tumor is able to overcome that and is able to restore the DNA repair. So that is one mechanism. And Again, in this box, there's probably different mechanism that the tumor can use to restore this DNA repair activity. Another box is of potential mechanism of resistance is a cell cycle, because the high-grade serous ovary cancer multiply very quickly, and they all can also use the cell cycle actually to overcome uh, the PARP inhibitor as well. And the third box is the PARP inhibitor don't go to its target, and the cancer is able to actually have the PAP not getting in the cancer cell. What we know, and what is now really well described, is actually patients on Olaparib have developed some reversion mutation. So initially, they have 
the BRCA mutation, and these, it's, the tumor is able actually to change the mutation to be functional again. And that has been really well uh, described and show also that it's a dynamic process and the disease evolving. So to go on the archival tissue now will be not sufficient. We probably need to have the tissue at the time of recurrence because the archival tissue didn't mean anything because it's a dynamic process because the cell changed under treatment. So we know now very well that the patient with a BRCA mutation can reverse and get a reversion BRCA that actually is worse for the patient. And it's again, it's very small study, but showing that the patient with a BRCA mutation that reverse the BRCA mutation on the graph here are really resistant and the outcome is worse. We definitely need to have biomarker to be able to identify this patient. So again, the circulating tumor DNA may be a tool that we can use to assess that. It's not only BRCA1 and 2 mutation that can have a reversion. We can also have other reversion in other genes involved in the DNA repair, as so as RAD51C or Y51D. But basically, in conclusion, we know that there is multiple, multiple mechanisms that will lead to the resistance, and all these mechanisms can be a regroup of restoration of the DNA repair function, and we need to identify them to try to see what is the best next line of treatment. Another strategy, and, and that is a strategy that is currently assessed in different trials, is we can try to combine. Because if, if we go in different way, maybe the cell will not be able to develop this resistance. So here we, we have this uh, schema, so you have your cancer cell, so we SPAP, we target the DNA, but then we can try to target the cell cycle, which is a mechanism of resistance. We can also try to target the microenvironment. We can try to target the angiogenesis pathway or the immune cell as well, to try to avoid the resistance. What we know with PARP inhibitor and antiandrogenic is a huge area of investigation. We went this way because we know that ovarian cancer have a high expression of VEGF and anti-VEGF in ovarian cancer is efficient. We know that from different trials already. And now there's a lot of trial ongoing trying to combine PARP inhibitor and antiandrogenic. And it's just uh, this trial that I want to highlight now because we got the result of this phase two trial. It was patient in the platinum-sensitive recurrence. They didn't have chemotherapy. They were treated with olaparib and sedirinib. And here's the update of the result for the patient who have this treatment. And you can see that the patient who do not have this BRCA mutation, the PFS was significantly improved from nearly 5.7 months to 23.7 months with a combination sedirinib or olaparib. So it shows that even if you don't have this BRCA mutation, PARP may be still potential activity, but need to be combined with something else. I know. I'm <laughs> so at the gain of some side effect, and the side effect of the combination is fatigue, diarrhea, and hypertension. But we have multiple trials like, that is ongoing, and we will have soon the result. So here's this trial that I want uh, you to be aware to follow the result. This Paola trial, because we have this question about in the first-line setting, some patient may have Avastin if the surgery was not complete. So what do we do if they have the BRCA mutation, they need to have Avastin, what do we do? And this specific trial will answer the question. It was a trial, is a first-line setting, the patient were randomized between having Olaparib, Avastin, versus Bevacizumab alone. So this trial is complete track roll, the result will be soon, but that would be very important to answer the question. Multiple of other trials ongoing. This one is not on the first line, into the platinum sensitive recurrence. So the patient have been randomized uh, between Avastin or Niraparib or the combination. That was at the time of platinum sensitive recurrence. The trial uh, has been also complete to accrual, so the result will be coming up. But again, it's a very important trial uh, to see what response we will have, and we will have comparison. Another trial also. Uh, that time in the platinum resistance setting, where the patient have received the weekly taxol bevacizumab as a standard of care, or the olaparib bevacizumab. And again, that will be very important to assess the result of this trial. Another area of very interesting investigation is try to combine the PARP inhibitor treatment with the immune therapy. Why it may be important is because we know that high-grade cells of cancer have a lot of DNA damage. So we know that they have a huge immunity normally because of the DNA damage. And actually, when you give a PARP inhibitor treatment to the patient, that usually increases the pdl one expression. So there's a very rational to combine them both. And in addition, the patient with a BRCA 
mutation usually have a higher tumor burden than the patient with no BRCA mutation. And this is currently ongoing as well, so that is an early phase trial uh, that has been assessed combining nirapraipiplenlorzumab. The phase one showed it was safe, and the result also saw this early signal of activity by combining the two. And what is very important here is that the response rate was around 25%. And as you can see here, not only in the BRCA population, this combination of pembrolizumab and nirapril was active if you don't have a HRD-like population. So that is very important. Another trial, and my last slide, uh, is uh, trying to see if we can do olaprib, jovalumab, or even the triplet, the olaprib, jovalumab, and bevacizumab. This combination, again, seems to be safe, and we also have an early sign of uh, activity. So it's why we know that VGF is active, immune therapy may be active with a PARP inhibitor treatment, so we know that combining may be efficient, and currently there is this all this first-line trial ongoing, assessing actually the combination because it's based on the fact that we know that anti and PARP inhibitor are synergistic. We also know that pd one and PARP is synergistic. So the idea is to see if we combine them all, how we can probably improve the outcome or not, and if we will try to overcome the resistance of the treatment. And what is important, we talk a lot about the high-grade serous ovarian cancer, but we need to be aware that there's a different subgroup of ovarian cancer that may also have a different response to the treatment. And for that, I, I thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, so if we have one burning question, I think it was very clear and very elaborate, like I expected, so that's great. Uh, Steve, yeah. I'll ask one question. So I know your answer is going to be a clinical trial, but uh, <laughs> it, so patients, you know, we're seeing more and more patients on PARP inhibitors, and they will progress on PARP inhibitors. So what is your management for, what do you recommend for a patient who's on a PARP inhibitor for a year in maintenance, and then they progress? What, what, what are your thoughts? So you're right. My first question, <laughs> my first answer would be clinical trial. Um, Clinical trial, why? Is because I think, as we know now, the mechanism of resistance would be different for each patient. So we need to identify them, and we need to know what is the mechanism because the response to the other line will be different. Uh, but currently, a standard of care is, is, again, based on the platinum-free interval. If actually they relapse within six months from the last dose of chemo, then we will go with our standard chemotherapy, and if it's more than six months, I will try to rechange with a platinum-based chemo. Okay, so then if they respond again to platinum-based chemotherapy, what, what, what would you think about using the PARP inhibitor again? That is a, is a question that is currently assessed as part of a clinical trial that is run in Europe and hopefully in Canada soon, where the patient has been on olaparib maintenance treatment post-response to treatment, uh, trying to rechallenge with uh, olaparib again. Uh, we don't know the answer yet. There were a presentation at SGO this year. It was, again, a retrospective, but there's value of retrospective data, as we say. It was a small uh, study, but actually the patient received the PARP inhibitor at the first line, which we need to make a difference also when you got the PARP at the time of recurrence or first line. The patient who get the PARP inhibitor at first line seems that some patient had derived benefit of rechallenge of a PARP inhibitor treatment at the recurrence. With a different one. <laughs> it's a good question, yeah, because, yeah, because it was all different clinical trial. Can you just uh, comment on clear cell carcinoma with the use of Pembro for these patients? Uh, are you using PDL1 to detect uh, patients who can benefit from that, or are you using MECIH, MECIH, or what are you doing in your center for these patients? So, yeah, so it, it, it's true that the PARP inhibitor was mainly for the high-grade serous ovarian cancer or the other type with a BRCA mutation. Uh, clear cell is usually known to be chemo relatively chemo-resistant, and the trial that is currently ongoing with immune therapy, it's the clear cell ovarian cancer seems to be the one that may drive benefit from immune therapy. Um, so it's true that if we have a patient with a clear cell ovarian cancer, we try uh, to get an immune therapy um, by different mechanism, and it's true that it's probably the patient population where we may eventually try to get the MSI and see if we can get access to pembrolizumab, yes. 